Virginia, here's the button. I'm glad things are better now, Mary. I used to think being divorced was easy, easier than being widowed. When someone dies, you blame yourself. You say, what did I do wrong? You feel guilty for living. Women blame themselves for divorce, too. They ask, what did I do wrong to make him behave that way? They even blame themselves when their children get divorced. Since we have so little power in the world, we over-exaggerate our importance in the family, which is the only place many of us are allowed to feel important. I guess so. Anyway, I know a lot of women lose husbands through divorce or death. There are lots of widows around because men marry younger women and die younger. But it seemed at first as if I was the only one. I understand, Mary, about your letter to a suburbanite. We were best friends with our neighbors, and after Ralph's death, it seemed wherever I went, they were always together. She was the echo of his steps, and he drew in her closeness like a fragrance. Silent and close, they dreamt by the fire, spent as the embers, simple with loving. Watching their unison, I yearned for moments that never again would be for me, for me, for me. Oh, I did my share of crying, too. I suppose it is good I did. If I had to give advice to others, I'd say, when a loved one is dying, go into the woods and cry. Only pure beauty like the sight of sun on water, or bird songs in loved trees that he will never share again, will bring those tears for his darkness and yours. The clumsy comfort of friends and the strange running or bargaining you will do will only make a tighter vise around your throbbing head and angry throat. Go alone to beauty. Mourn your aloneness and weep for the loved one and for yourself and for the fragility of life when the world shared is so beautiful. In the end, we are all alone, but there is still beauty. It is eternal, and so are memories alive in us. For me, the memory of Ralph is very strong. I'm not a single at heart. I can't go to bars or clubs like some women alone do, seeking to end singleness, at least for one night. I know times have changed, but I haven't. I suppose I am still his. Sometimes I have thought the pressure of another body would wipe away his imprint, but my desire flows backward, stubborn as the tide, to the wedding bed. So I wear his ring still, cursing the throat lump that certain music brings. Weren't you ever angry at what had happened to you? Certainly. Once I baked bread, and because I had to eat it alone, threw half into the yard for the dogs. I even went through a period of isolation and self-pity. I shut myself away thinking, Plants are more predictable than people. If you give plants enough water, light, and warmth, they will reward you. People, on the other hand, even given considerable attention, may forget you, or become hostile, or even die. Begonias are better. I was actually mad at my children and grandchildren for being occupied with their own lives. I hated the empty nest. I felt I had no home. There was no love in those walls which enclosed my grief. No comfort in plants and colors with which I tried to deceive. There cannot be a home for one where there have been many. A woman alone becomes an orphan, crying in the night with only cold walls to hear. You seem all right now. It's hard to believe that you were like that. 
How did you get to feeling better? I'm not sure. Maybe time. Maybe my need and strength to survive. One day I was ready to give up what seemed an impossible life. The next day there was light and air and energy. The dark had gone as quickly as it came. I could exult again at music and at the sight of sun on snow. The papers I had thrown about to signal my despair could be put in neat and manageable piles. I could do what needed to be done, and what before seemed a task beyond endurance. Even though I had lost him, I would not wear black and put on spring colors, being as I was meant to be. Yesterday I mourned. Today I have a life to celebrate. I have myself. I realized it was not my fault Ralph was dead and that he would want me to enjoy life. I began to do things and take as many trips as I could afford. If not now, when? I am luckier financially than many widows. At the slightest invitation, I bed down in strange cities. From my lair in Bedford Square, I took London in a week. Paris is my harem now, and Aberdeen, and Amsterdam, and Bath, and Berkeley, too. New York and Washington are mine. I have dallied with Chicago, San Francisco, and Tucson, Puerto de la Cruz, and Marrakesh. I do not love you less because I made Atlanta mine. <laughs> if I cannot have lovers, I shall have cities. Sixty cannot be coy as twenty with lovers waiting in the wings. I go boldly to conquer cities. Who is to judge of consummations and compensations? I also decided when home to get out daily for exercise and seeing people. I joined the Y and began to use the pool. We are sweatless and weightless. Purity personified our rhythmic motion comforting as we unite with fluids of our individual and species birth. We are grateful for oceans, lakes, and pools where body merges intimately with perfect medium. So even those unlucky or clumsy everywhere else glide and hide gracefully into crystal refuge. Swimming burns off sexual energy too. <laughs> yes, I know. If they knew how sensuous swimming was, they might ban it. <laughs> I'm in an exercise class at the Y, too. Also, I made some terrific new friends, including Elizabeth, who I brought tonight to this group. Elizabeth is a dedicated, almost full-time volunteer at the Y and other places. She got me into volunteering, and that helped me too. The least I could do was get her into this group. And now the least I can do is to give Elizabeth her to her to talk. Well, I've been listening to all your troubles, and I just feel so lucky that at 70 I still have my husband. He is special, a truly faithful and kind man. Not all men are like your ex, Mary. Our marriage has lasted 50 years. So far, we have good health and are enjoying life and can help others. It feels good to be 70. 70 is being outside on a November day knowing the fragility of sunshine. Seventy is facing lost causes and fighting on, having little to lose. Seventy is lost and dry tears unseen, but also passion and private jokes suddenly revealed by light. Seventy is waking early to see treasures which there is no room to hold. Seventy is sensing which stranger will give the ecstasy of friendship and who will betray. At seventy, you grasp wisdom in your hands while they are still strong. 
Go into 70, hoping and loving. You will be women made beautiful by having lived well and long. You give me courage to get older. I've decided what's important in life. We tend to obsess sometimes about nothing. I'm beyond that now. Having climbed the mountain, I came down the other side, carried carefully mementos collected with great effort going up. Halfway down, I stopped and suddenly hurled away those no longer treasures, amazed that I had cherished such burdens. I have learned to live for each day and be grateful for it. We women are lucky because we love to nurture and can nurture through life, though not always in the same way we did once. I love being a senior volunteer, and I love days like the one I had at the beach last May. I lust for the ocean. And in May, when sunbathers huddle with shawls on the beach, I swim the waves alone, warm with joy. My sole ownership was challenged when Amy, seven and a half, introduced herself and asked how to float. Don't be afraid and you won't sink, I said. She replied, I'll play dead. Not dead, I told her, just relax. The water holds you up. Neither of us cold. Seventy swam with seven. I taught her how to float while her parents sun and Amy stroked my toes in gratitude, <laughs> teaching love. Wherever you go, Amy, I shall go in the spring, your seventy. You will recall how a May swimmer taught you courage. Though I shall be long gone, I will live then in you, my child and my sister. <laughs> yes, life is good. The only thing, of course, that I worry about is that my health may fail, or that Jim will get sick, or that I will become senile. Even my children grow old. I see my years written on their once soft faces, now wise and worn. I hope at 80 I can still do the things I love. Dora, what is it like to be 80? Here's the button. You're the same as you always have been. A little achy sometimes, stiff in the morning, forgetful. Yet within, you are all the things you ever were and more. Two years past 80, I forget a lot of things that I wanted to forget. <laughs> like watching my words. <laughs> I remember a lot of things I thought I had forgotten. Like Miss Brown. Making kindergarten seem like home. Two years past 80, I own my old body with all its imperfections and like myself. Two years past 80, I spot a new bird, learn a wildflower name, see a great-grandchild smile, hear live for the first time Bach Sonata in C major. Tell the president off. <laughs> Drink a new wine. And make new friends of you. There are lots of good things. However, 
The bad thing is, some people don't see you at all. They only see age and reject you because of that. It makes me furious when people start to talk to me as though I were a child. Mad turns inward, becomes sad. So I express myself. I am in this old body, but not of it. My mind runs barefoot, unwinded along the ocean. And my spirit climbs mountains. Who are you to judge my, me unfit and unlovable when I so love the world and human touch? You know, some people never touch old people as if they are repulsive. I noticed when I was in the hospital, the interns and medical students stood practically across the room, and they couldn't wait to get out of the room. It was different with the younger patients. Old folks have the same needs as other people for closeness. I let them know how I felt about it. I'll make a prediction. I will leave as I came, screaming pain. I shall not accept with grace the indignities of age or the indignities to, uh, to age. But exit, not too soon. Decrying my doom, hating my fate, protesting my loss, pushing back the end with every angry breath. I like what you said. I, <laughs> I like what you said. I admire your gut. I need to learn how to be 80 in a world insensitive to older people. Can you be specific about how to handle folks when they treat us as stupid because we're old? I'll give you an example. The electric company overcharges me. But there's nowhere else I can buy electricity. I call and complain. They yes me, but still overcharge. I will keep calling and talking. How much do they pay their, their uh, telephone clerks? Not bad. Gives me some good ideas. I know what Dora and Elizabeth mean about ageism. I feel it already at 60 and get angry too. Certainly at 50 you experience it, as I told you. And at 40. Even at 30. The double standard of aging exists. Men and employers bypass you for the 20-year-olds. At high school, many senior men prefer the freshman women. <laughs> Ageism is a common disease. But you should do what you can about it. And you shouldn't wait till my age to start fighting ageism. Also, more young women ought to get acquainted with older women to prepare for aging. I am glad I have you. Many of my friends and my husband have died. A few of my old friends no longer recognize me. But I have come to some reconciliation with my losses. No love is lost, even though the lover turns away from you and life.
within us are the people we have loved, not as they were, but as we wanted them to be. As our fresh grief softens to sorrow, we suddenly discover the lover's eyes in our mirror, the lover's voice on our lips. Even the beloved's jokes have become ours. What reality has taken, we have taken for our own. Nothing is ever lost. Layers of our being contain all that has lived for us or that we have imagined. We exude the strength of our losses and our gains glow in the dark. All in all, friends, to live as well as I do, I need my rest. I think it is time to call off this meeting. If anyone has anything else to say, you better do it fast. <laughs> I'm alive. I'm well. I survive. I survive well. Lisa? <laughs> I'm alive, I'm well, I survive, and I survive well. I'm alive, I'm well, I survive, I survive well. I'm alive, I survive, I'm well, and I survive well. I'm alive, I'm well, I survive, I survive well. I'm alive. I'm well, I survive, I survive well. I'm alive, I'm well, I survive, and I survive well. We will rest together, together on, on our ambivalences. We will we share their islands as we struggle for Sure. It is ironic. Helene was voted most likely to succeed by our class, but when she came to the reunion, she was a mess. She was one of the first of us to marry. But her successful, brilliant husband turned out to be a mean bastard and alternated between abusing and ignoring her and the kids. She's still with him, but their marriage is rotten. As for Helene, voice husky from gin and tobacco, my girlhood friend sits across the room telling of troubles unbearable and born in bars. Wherever we go, she must pause for a drink. Her smoke combines with my tears so that I can barely see her and wonder, not without anger, if she I loved is still in sorrow. I try hard not to hate this now stranger destroyed by life and by her remedies. We walking wounded, triage to ourselves, we're barely visible, we're living alone, or with cats, or catastrophic people, we're humans too. Oh, I have sought the longingness, but nowhere have I found a home, except these bars where I buy a seat. Those who do not belong, long for companionship. 
Even Thoreau left Walden. Full circle I come from loneliness and pain to this circle, my glass and double pain. Life, which withheld, may yet give, and so can be trusted. Life, which destroyed, is a buzzard. One runs from buzzards, or your flesh is theirs. Peter, who is to say I do not love you well? because another lover wooed and won. Too many yesterdays creep into today's. Her clock is clogged with soggy memories, unresolved and unresolvable. Her clock threatens to stop and she to stop it. She who raced against time is running out of time. another blow, and when it did not come, remained frozen, waiting. Let me review the case history. She was referred to me by her internist because she kept getting physical symptoms with no organic cause. She was brought up, like many women of her generation, to be good and to be a lady under all circumstances. She drank the draft diluted. Emotions, too, were muted in patterns primly suited to lull each living note. She walked in paths soft-lighted, and passion's fire was slighted, for fear her heart, when sighted, would rising sear her throat. She said she was contented. Beneath her pain fermented, as heart and soul resented her holding life remote. How are you feeling, Catherine? Like walking alone in November of rotted oak leaves, in cold rain at midnight, knowing winter will close in you soon and forever. That bad? They'll find me there, my unclean house and the stink of my rock. Wafted through closed doors and bolted windows. I'm sorry you feel so terrible. My parents told me not to cry. You said I could. I cry now. For pains frozen the half century. I walk across the bridge to Tuesdays where I have a life within a life that turns reality to drama mused upon with you, who I beg love me a little, or pretend you do. Let me love you in a life within a life of shadow. I know I have become important to you in our time together. I do care. But you need to make a life in the real world. Nests are hard to come by. Fledgling flyers often fail and fall to unreceptive ground. Full grown, I staggered frozen to your doorstep where, warm, protected from the storm outside, I dared the storm within, seeing in your eyes unfaltering stars and in your hands Barriers against that fateful final misstep into the chasm, always underfoot and calling. To leave the doorstep of an imperfect mother with only young fears is hard enough. To leave the doorstep of a perfect mother 
with adult knowledge of the raging storms is too much to ask. I do not trust life or myself, only you. I cry, stay with me always. I'm afraid. But you offer me a paradox to earn your approval and my own. I must give you up. I have to learn to conjugate the verb to be in the first person singular and the present tense. That's right. You have to work on your life in the world outside this office. You have a lot to offer in the real world. I shall be free, as you would have me be free. And armed enough, bear the pain, parting and leaving you, go on with hope to see this present tense of life now starting. Though now I stand against the door, reliving history once more, please know I will not drag your light into the grave where I have lived so long. Please wait till I feel by day and night that I am I for once, and I am strong. I understand what you are asking me so movingly. But unfortunately, we do have to deal with reality, even here. You have more strength now than you know. I'm sorry, but your health insurance is used up for psychiatric treatment. I know you cannot afford the fees I have to charge because of my realities. The next session will have to be our last. We will talk then about how you will manage. I will give you a list of self-help groups in the area and also of social agencies which have low fees. We will say a proper goodbye. Now our hour, hour is up, regretfully. I hate to push you out, but another patient is waiting. Thank you. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I hated doing that. But I can't work for nothing. I must support myself. I tried hard. She's better than when she came. At least I haven't made her drug dependent. She feels better physically. Before, she was headed for unnecessary surgery. She could have used more therapy, but there are so many others waiting. So many casualties. They keep slipping on the ice and there seems to be nobody out there sanding the streets. I have needs too. Patients expect more of women doctors and I suppose of other women professionals. And they get angrier at women than at men when we can't deliver everything forever. The Catherines see us as perpetual nurturers, but we are only human. Each woman's pregnant face invites seduction, rejection, always. My breast is empty. My ear is tired. Please take endless troubles other places. Help yourself. Be quiet. Manage. For now, I am out of chicken soup, and the only client for my couch is me. Get out of here. But we won't. They put us in jail for protesting the missiles, and we'll stay here to make people aware. Yes, we must do what we can to stop a war with a stay. Agreed. But the dirt in this jail is awful. I need a bath. 
Agreed, also. But if those guards don't stop yelling dyke, I may hit one. It's maddening the newspapers keep diverting attention from our anti-war protest to snicker that I'm a lesbian. They don't bother mentioning that you, Sarah, are married, and you, Lois, have a male lover, and Consuelo is a widow. Beth, you forget. They keep writing about my kids being at home unmothered while I'm here in jail. They forget the kids have a father. The truth is, they don't see women at all as full people. They trivialize the causes we believe in, and they don't take our political actions seriously. They simply point to our sexuality, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, and to our mother role as if, this, as if that is our only identity. You're right. To tell the truth, when they don't take us seriously, even I, sometimes in weak moments, begin to wonder why we put ourselves on the line. For a cause that's probably lost anyway. They keep building the nukes and the weapons and starting wars. No matter what we do. I think we'd better remind ourselves why we are here. That would be good. It would help me also to seek why we are here. The bishop's lawyer wanted to pay a fine and release me. I wanted to come to the truth of it. Was I wrong to do what I did and to stay here? Okay, let's talk about it. You first, Sarah. It may sound dramatic when I tell you how I feel, but I feel that way. A life needs goals to stretch toward. I saw in my children's soft young faces my mission and my goal. I would give them love and the world would be theirs. I kissed each warm and precious cheek, but when I recognized that the world, what the world really is, I pulled away in shock to find the death heads cold beneath. I saw my Jewish children's children marching through the gas ovens, all bringing with them little goals like worn out toys to bed. I also saw that as we stockpile neutron bombs which destroy only life, not property, children stroll slowly home from school through radioactive brain carrying mutated, defective genes, clutching school books, celebrating war, yearning for uniforms and guns, holding already congealed concepts of what we and they, properly socialized, made too stupid to love. During Vietnam, our children burnt villages, burnt flesh. The generals tell us international relations are too complex for us. It is hard even to remember the names that separate us into neighborhood. But I know we shall have peace only if we wish it enough. Mothers have a special responsibility to work for peace. That is why I am here. It's interesting that you, a Jew, and I, a Christian, are close in values. Some of the things you just said could have been written by a person who inspired me. Dr. Albert Schweitzer. He was a Christian clergyman, physician, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize 25 years ago. He said, the spirit is a mighty force for transforming things. He also said, we shall have peace only when we want peace. And have reverence for life. And Rediscover the fact that we all, together, are human beings. Some of us awakened even before Vietnam. My revulsion for war started with World War II. As a young Red Cross volunteer, I walked daily through trains of three-tiered stretchers with mutilated men my age then. Glad to leave the killings, but never young again. I also walked through trains of caskets. I walked there still. Later, after Vietnam, my student veterans wept to me their despair and guilt. It was our guilt, too. 
In this time of fatal irreverence for life, this Christian joins with you, Sarah, a Jew. We both belong to what Schweitzer called the fellowship of those who bear the mark of pain. He meant by that those who have felt hurt, can empathize with hurt, help to heal hurt, and end the hurting. That's why I'm here. I suppose I'm anti-war because I'm a physician. I have glimpsed the wonders of the cell and the human body so marvelous and beautiful that even brilliant scientists aren't sure how it all works. But a bullet can stop life instantly. Lungs are a marvel of design, but fallout destroys a million lungs. Between the wars, they mourn the dead and hide the wounded and speak of peace, meanwhile arming. You know, one semester while in medical school, during the winter break, I went to St. Augustine, Florida. There's an old fort there, the Fort of San Marco, which is beautiful. It's right on the bay. Ferns grow in the furnaces which were used in colonial times to heat cannonballs to set enemy ships afire. Now, people sit peacefully on the walls, enjoying the beauty of the old walls, the birds, and the water. It's a tamed fort. My dream is that all the energy that goes into war preparation and war itself can be channeled into preserving and enhancing life. As a physician, my job is to conserve life and nuclear war may destroy it utterly. That's why I'm here. Sister, why are you here? Well, you all know that the work our Lord gave me to do was to run a city kitchen that feeds those no one else will feed. Lately, with the high unemployment, we have had so many more people coming, including fine, proud people. They are ashamed because they can't get work, though it is not their fault. People of all religions and kinds ask us for all types of help besides food because many government and government-subsidized social services have been cut or eliminated. The government is spending our money on arming itself with other countries. I needed to come to the truth of why such a rich country cannot take care of its own people, and why countries all over the world are impoverishing their people, also to stockpile armaments when indeed there are enough munitions now to destroy civilization. I prayed and prayed to understand and for help for the world. Then one day during Mass, I felt God wanted women to say the time had come to end the war in preparation for war. So I joined you on the picket line, and when they told us to leave, I stayed with you. And when they dragged you to the police van, I refused to move also. So they took me to the van, too. I noticed that they carried me gently, though. And I prayed for you who were being handled roughly. I pray also for those nuns, the sisters of mine in Christ, who have been killed and suffered abominations for their work against war and for the people. Thank you for your prayers, sister. I guess it is my time to tell why I am here. I will not say it as well as you, who have more education. I had to go to work very early and worked all my life in factories, even when my children were small. There was not time for books. My husband did hard labor. He died young, worn out. My children are grown now, and I have only myself to take care of. But I feel I must have care for the world. There has not been much work in my city lately. 
The shoe factory where I worked for 20 years closed. The only job I could get was making parts for the bombers that America supplies other countries to use in their wars and that our government buys to prepare for war. I didn't like doing this work, but I had to eat and pay my rent and help my neighbors. I've always been a hard worker and last month they decided to give me 20 cents extra an hour because I was so fast. Can you imagine 20 cents when the company makes so much money on those government contracts? Anyway, one night I saw on television the dead and terribly wounded people after a bombing raid. Some looked like my children. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. The next day, I told my boss to keep the 20 cents extra an hour and the job. I would not anymore make weapons to kill people. I took a bus to your city hoping to find work that was not bloody. I happened to pick up one of your anti-war leaflets on the street. It had Sarah's phone. I called Sarah. I joined you in the picketing. I must do what I must do to face myself. I love this country, but not what it is doing now. It was good to share. I feel better. Reinforced. We are, we are in the middle of war and peace, radicalism and conservatism, private concern and political action, activism and retreatism, convenience and the environment, our country and universality. We will make splashes as we thrust with other women toward a shore uncharted but not denied by us. When the storm hits hard, why do I go on waving those branches like a fool or a beckoner? Those of us going into marriages, those of us coming out of marriages, pause as we pass, asking, why such strains? Those of us going into jobs, and those of us coming out of jobs, look at each other in the eyes with deep compassion. Who shall protect us from these spiders, these managers, these leaders who spin papers and words and such? corrupt webs. Where shall we go to dream those dreams to keep us from the sewers and the grave? Why do most jobs, why do many marriages alienate men and women from each other and themselves? I don't know. I only know that I came into this isolation knowing that before we parted, we lay body to body, man and woman together, unclothed and unmasked in our need for comfort, yet could take none from each other for more than a minute. A moment I recall weeping for what might have strengthened us instead of sending us to weep alone. Why, when life is lost and humans fragile, don't we cling together instead of blaming those we love the most? How can we revenge ourselves upon the world instead of upon each other or ourselves? It's so sad. Somewhere. Someone. Somehow. Something. Soon. Please. Somewhere is here. The someone is ourselves, sisters. The somehow is direct action. The something 
is unity. The soon is now. There is no time for waiting, no strength to spend on tears. There is no place for forgetting or seeking escape from the world. We can't shield ourselves. We must wield power. I admire you, Sarah, but women don't have much power now. Not all of us are able or ready to go to jail for our convictions. Some of us take care of the everyday. I take care of my 94-year-old mother, who is frail in body and mind. No one else will do it. Women help as they can. Look at Dora. She knows where to find hope, strategies, diversions, and even laughter. Dora connects us to herself and to each other. Yes, I believe we are all connected, men and women and nature. In my lifetime, I have seen how we have forgotten this. Nature is important to me. Though my grandmother and mother lived in slums, they taught me how to love the earth. In the crowded, dirty city, we always had plants blooming in the windows and on the fire escapes. Strangers would wonder how mother and grandmother made so much light in a dark place. They didn't know they did it through love and a need to foster growth. Marmita even stole for her plants. Our neighborhood had only cement and gravel. Marmita would have thought it funny that people today buy dirt in the stores, what we call potting soil. She went to the park with a bag that she had made out of an old coat and it was worn out and dug up loam from behind the rose bushes. They won't miss it, she said. Her dream was that someday she would have a farm in the country. Well, she never got her farm. But on summer nights, she took me up to the roof and showed me the stars and the moon. I have always loved the moon. I remember as an adolescent during World War II being shocked to hear on the radio that there had been a successful bombing raid because the target could be pinpointed in the full moon. Up until then, for me and for many people, the moon had been a symbol of tranquility, peace, love, and womanhood. Well, then men landed on the moon. And now the moon is a symbol of the space age, which makes possible terrible weapons. I think women should reclaim the moon. If you wouldn't think it's silly, we could all come together in a circle and I could recite my woman chant about the full moon. Moon lit, moon struck, we gather to celebrate the full moon in this full circle, our own full moon. We are moons, round, cyclic, constant, givers of light, sewers of buttons, fillers of cups. We women know circles. We come in ones and twos and groups for respite, sheer beauty, dreams, laughter, hopes, sorrows, tensions, fears. 
and in the sharing gain courage for another month, another struggle. Full moon, full heart, full house, full cups, full friends, full wounds for some, full friends, full joy. Speak who you are. I am Ruth Edgerton Hope, daughter of, daughter of Levina, granddaughter of Lucinda and Samira, great-granddaughter of Charity and Mary, Hannah and Mary.